This is the sermon for the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. This morning we are reading from Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, beginning with the 29th verse. Now as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying down, sick with a fever. So they spoke to Jesus at once about her. He came and raised her up, gently taking her hand. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. When it was evening, after sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered by the door. So he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. But he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. Then Jesus got up early in the morning, when it was still very dark, departed, and went out to a deserted place, and there he spent time in prayer. Simon and his companions searched for him. When they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. He replied, Let us go elsewhere, into the surrounding villages, so that I can preach there too. For that is what I came here to do. So he went out into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. In one sense, I have already dealt with this text last week. I saw today's pericope as a continuation of last week's lesson and based my address on a common theme running between the two. The fact that Jesus would not allow the demons, or the unclean spirits, as in the case of last week's text, to have any sort of voice, even, in fact, when they proclaimed the truth. Jesus, you are the Son of the Most High. Nonetheless, they were still silenced. And so, as we endeavor to walk in the ways of Christ, to follow the path that he sets before us, we must also silence the demons we encounter, those within and those without, demons, as it were, of prejudice and hatred, demons of greed and envy. None must be allowed a voice. None must be given a chance to direct our thoughts and our moral direction. This morning, I'd like to look at our appointed gospel lesson, still, I believe, connected to what was last week's text, Jesus preaching and then casting out unclean spirits in Capernaum, but to look at it from a different, but nonetheless connected perspective. As we consider first a portion from last week's text, what comes directly before the account of Jesus and Simon's mother-in-law, from the middle of verse 21. When the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people there were amazed by his teaching because he taught them like one who had authority, not like the experts in the law. Just then, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, Leave us alone, Jesus the Nazarene. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him. Silence, come out of him. After throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. The onlookers, we are told, are amazed and wonder at what they call a new teaching, and moreover, a teaching with extraordinary authority. What is it that the onlookers find so extraordinarily authoritative? Well, obviously, there's the fact that Jesus cast out what Mark's Gospel calls an unclean spirit, and that Jesus commanded, said spirits, specifically, do not say anything. But also, 
I would suggest that in so doing, in healing this afflicted individual, Jesus is effectively running roughshod over the prevailing social order. It will be difficult to overestimate the role that ceremonial cleanliness or uncleanliness played in the religious culture of Jesus' day. While the Old Testament speaks of clean versus unclean and holy versus unholy, by Jesus' day, unclean and unholy had become rather conflated, and the lines of demarcation were drawn simply between that which was unclean and that which is holy. If you had a disease, you were most likely unclean. If you were a foreigner, you were more often than not unclean. Actions could make one unclean. Lineage could make one unclean. And unclean meant the opposite of holy. So the man with the unclean spirit was himself considered unclean. The normal reaction to unclean in Jesus' day was to expel the unclean thing or person, at least until it or they could be somehow rendered clean. Perhaps that was a part of what the onlookers marveled at. Jesus seemed only concerned about what ailed the man. The fact that the man himself was unclean because he had been a vessel, as it were, for unclean spirits seemed to be of no consideration for Jesus. In compassion, Jesus heals the man. Now, we might say, oh, those short-sighted, unfeeling people in the first century. But surely, we can actually understand their perspective. Our processes of cleansing are, in fact, just as rigorous and difficult to accomplish as theirs, if somewhat different. We, too, have a tendency not to distinguish between the person and the thing that makes the person unclean. Consider, if you will, our version of social uncleanliness. Take, for example, a convicted criminal. Now, most would agree that a criminal must make recompense, usually in the form of a societally sanctioned penance of prison. Commit, for example, grand theft. One steals something valuable, like an automobile. Another perpetrator is caught, tried, convicted, and sentenced. The criminal does his time, as the saying goes, and he is ultimately released, perhaps even released early for good behavior. So he goes on with life, yes? Well, perhaps not so much. For in today's world, the individual will discover that he must either voluntarily disclose his former life on every job application, and if perchance he doesn't, it will undoubtedly show up on the required background check. More than likely, said former criminal, will have a very difficult time finding any sort of meaningful employment or renting an apartment or getting a bank loan. More than likely, this individual will carry a label, ex-con, for a long time. A label that in many ways, and certainly in many minds, will make this person unclean. Or what perhaps of the individual who is caught in some sort of scandal, something which seems to happen with ever-increasing rapidity and sensationalism in our time? What of the person whose uncensored private thoughts are suddenly outed through the magic of online hacking. Careers crash down. Social standing is ruined. The futures become uncertain. Would we ourselves let such people into our churches, into our clubs and social circles? 
Would we want them as neighbors? Would we let them near our children? Our culture, too, has its version of unclean, an uncleanliness that is difficult, if not impossible, to overcome. But none of that seems to matter to Jesus. Not at all, in fact. It seems that Jesus' worldview, for him, compassion trumps the established social order. This fellow is unclean? Really, who cares? Or worse yet, Jesus says, no problem. He's unclean? We can fix that. A new teaching with some kind of new authority. Now we get at last to today's text, and it is as if the authors of Mark's Gospel are reinforcing the point. Just as Mark gives us another example of Jesus silencing the demons, as he would not allow them to speak, as he cast them out of those in the gathering crowd who were so afflicted, so he gives us another example of Jesus overriding the established social order with its long entrenched boundaries. Simon Peter's mother-in-law is ill. Jesus comes to her, takes her hand, and gently raises her up. The fever leaves her. We presume that Jesus has healed her, but the text is in fact not explicit if we look closely. Of course, that he healed her is an intimated, but I suppose we can safely presume that he did. But Mark clearly intends for us to look at what is explicit. Jesus treats the woman with uncommon tenderness and compassion. Again, something that it would be difficult to overestimate just how unusual it really is. Consider, any woman, any person really, but particularly a woman, let alone a woman with an unspecified illness, a woman hitherto unknown to a Jewish man, might very well be unclean and was surely to be avoided. In general, men had little to do with women outside of their own families. It was, beyond a risk for ceremonial contamination, simply beneath them. A woman in that culture was at best a second-class citizen. Yet Jesus immediately deals with her compassionately. But again, compassion seems to be the only order Jesus acknowledges. The norms of society, it seems, mean nothing to him. Mark mentions that immediately after the fever leaves her, the woman reverts to what would have been her proper place in society, serving the guests, waiting on the men. Certainly. So it was in those days. But I would like to suggest even if it smacks just a little of eisegesis, of imposing a meaning on a text, that it may be that we're meant to understand that once a person is free of his or her ailments, free of what makes them unclean, once they are free, they are now ready to serve, ready to be of service to others, to the community. While we are still bound by our unclean spirits, by our demons, by whatever makes us less than our Creator intends, it is difficult to serve, maybe impossible. But once freed of that, then life, real life, begins again. Our text goes on to tell us that soon the whole town had gathered outside the door, it seems that illness and demon possession must have been pretty common for these people in the region of Galilee, things that diminish a person, things that distort lives, all very common, uh, common enough that 
at least from what we read in our text, it seems that everyone knew at least someone in such a condition. As it turns out, do we. We all know people in need of healing, in need of having that which renders them unclean cast out. We all know someone who wrestles with demons. We may even be that person ourselves. And we are told Jesus heals them indiscriminately, without regard for whom they were or where they were from. Again, flouting the social conventions. We just don't do that. And yet Jesus, in his revolutionary compassion, did. We're told that Jesus, after a period of rest and prayer, goes into the surrounding towns, preaching the good news and casting out demons. For this reason he came, he says to his disciples, Jesus, the author of a new social order, a new way of being, one unprecedented and, in fact, revolutionary, where compassion is the foundation and the only true law is the law of love. Mm -hmm.